my friend Dolph, how we doing, Chris. buddy? Good to see you. It's good to see you, my friend. Thank you for meeting up with me. You're welcome. Thank you for coming here. Guys, Come check in. it out. I'm here with the legendary Dolph the Roos, and today we are putting the boxing gloves on. We are going to be doing the epic showdown of real estate, real estate investing versus... Commercial. Residential versus commercial. May the best boxer win. Boom. One, 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 one shot. Now the future for sure. Let's go. I'm turning dreams into reality. Yeah. It's one on one shot. Now the future for sure. Let's go. Normally with Dolph, it's all good fun and games, but today we're putting a million dollars on the line and we're asking a really important question. If you had to make a million dollars, would you do it in the game of commercial? Would you do it in the game of real estate? I've done over $2 billion worth of residential real estate. This dude has worked on multi-billion dollar projects. So today the showdown gets real. Are you ready? I'm totally ready, yes. Okay, so here's a million bucks, Dolph. Okay. And here's the question. Yeah. What's easier, to make a million dollars in commercial or residential? Commercial, False. hands down. False. The most False. easy way possible False. because you can do one <laughs> deal in commercial and it'll make you 10 million and it can take you a decade and 50 houses to make that same. I'm money. not gonna lie. Dolph has like some element of truth in that a single deal you literally can make well over a million. You can make 10 million, you can make a hundred million dollars, right? So should we just finish the conversation? No. Yet? Thank you for admitting Because that. there are other benefits and other things. Like who wants a pile of money? I don't want a million bucks. You know what no. I want? I want a residual income that's passive, that's controllable, that covers not just all my minimal expenses, but all of my lifestyle that I actually want to have that I'm going for. And residential, it's done it for me. So which is better? Well, residential has done it for Thank you. you. Yes. Commercial has <laughs> done it for me. Okay, let's find out. And full disclosure, we both live in houses and we both office out of offices. So we this have an element true. of both. This is true. But we're talking about if you've got a marginal lump of cash and marginal million bucks that you want to invest, where would you place it? I personally would far sooner place it in commercial than residential. We'll see. Okay. In all fun and seriousness, we've all done our fair share of residential deals, commercial deals, and obviously, brother, you are the king of commercial. Just this last year, Dolph helped me buy a $7 million building, and one of the things that it did is it helped me save a million dollars in taxes. And so, you know, it's not always about making money. Sometimes it's literally about, commercial for me is often a tax game, but it's also a really powerful cash flow game. I would say, though, that there's a lot of people intimidated by commercial because it can seem daunting at the thought of buying, you know, a, a million dollar building, a $10 million building, a $100 million building. It's kind of scary, don't you think? It is scary and I understand that it's daunting for a lot of people and I'm grateful that it is because if it weren't so daunting, there'd be hundreds of thousands more investors in commercial property and I'd have a lot of competition. So one of the amazing advantages of commercial is I have much less competition than you would in residential. Well, and that's true because I built systems and when I look at the last $2 billion worth of real estate, 6,500 homes that we've transacted. I buy these up with people all over the world that are new to the game of real estate. They partner with me. We go in 50-50 into the game and they're taking money that they've set aside in 401ks, IRAs, and they've done the math and they know it's not enough money. Right. And there's, for a lot of people, there's something that just feels more comfortable and familiar with starting out in entry-level residential real estate as opposed to the game of commercial. So whereas I've got, I think, a large market share of people that want to play my game, there's very few that want to play yours, but when they can play it at the level you do, there's no doubt how big you win. That is true. It is also a fact that most people have lived in a house at some stage, so they know what to look for. If they go and look at a house that they're looking at buying and there's no kitchen or no front door for that matter, they're gonna say, hey, there's something wrong with it and they can identify it. But most people, when they look at commercial real estate, they wouldn't know what would be missing to justify them not buying it. So it's daunting, and that's why many people stay away from it. Well, we're gonna jump in right now on the major differences between both, and by the end of the video, we're gonna see who the winner is. I think that's a good idea. Okay, here we go. Bang, 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 you, bang. Okay, let's get clear on just a couple of basic definitions. When we talk about residential investing, we're talking about you know single family homes more or less. It could be a duplex, a triplex, a fourplex. In terms of banking and lending, we're talking about four doors 
or less on a building that a bank gives you money on where you're typically doing a long or short-term rental and it's easier to get your financing in place for conventional loans or getting a home equity line of credit, meaning, well, hey, the bank says that if I'm gonna live into it, uh, I can get an FHA 3.5% down payment or I could put a conventional 5% down or if it was non-owner occupied, like I'm not gonna live here, I'm, but I wanna buy it and rent it out, I might have to put 20% down. Um, the banking system is basically set up to say we're really comfortable issuing loans for real estate and that's this residential game that we're talking about. Right, but that's part of the problem. Why this arbitrary four doors or fewer? It should be a residential property is a property where people live. They have it as a residence and a commercial property is where people conduct commerce. So a five-door apartment complex or a 500-door apartment complex should be residential. You have the same limitations, the one-year residential tenancy agreement, the fact that tenants will put their fists through walls and then call you to fix it. I've never had a commercial tenant do that. In fact, they tend to keep their places looking really good because they earn their income there. Do you see what he's doing right now? He's undermining the whole, this is my slide. I'm here to talk about real estate, yes. and he's already basically jabbing, saying commercials yes. better, neener, neener. Neener, neener. <laughs> because you're appealing to what people think is the truth, to hoodwink them into believing that this is great, when in actual fact, we've got to stick to reality. A five-unit apartment complex is residential, folks. Okay, Dolph, this is your slide. Now you get to talk. That's the way this works. Okay, well, it might be my slide, but it was done by Investopedia, and they say tenants are business owners. For heaven's sake, the tenant of a residential property could be a business owner. I think what they're really saying is that the tenant occupying commercial space tends to run a commercial enterprise there. That means his objectives are different. He earns his money there. He wants to have that place looking good. He wants it to be in a good location. He's got a vested interest to having that place present really well. I love that aspect of commercial. All right, let me continue because you're obviously just going to sit here and wait for me, hopefully to trip myself up. I'm waiting. Not at all. There are so many categories of commercial. You've got retail, yes, office, but you've got hospitality, hotels and motels. You've got airport facilities. You've got rocket launch pads. And I was asked by the chief pilot of Virgin Galactic to find their rocket launch pad to get them into space. So if you want to get into space, you better be nice on this video. Okay. The number three here, triple net lease. Not all commercial leases are triple net, but triple net means that in addition to paying a base rent, the, pen, the tenant pays the outgoings of property taxes, insurance, and maintenance. You don't get that on residential. You as landlord pay the property taxes, insurance, and maintenance. I love the fact that the tenants willingly pay it. It's the industry norm. Well, at least on commercial compared to res residential, you gotta put down some fat down payments. Check this one out. Investopedia claims that it requires more investor capital and a lot more sophistication. What do you say to that? Well, I say to that abject BS because I think it is not very easy in the residential world to buy real estate without having any money. Usually you need to come up with 20% as an investor. Whereas time and time again, we can buy commercial real estate and pull money out of the deal. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, someone at the beginning of this video was boasting about a $7 million property that he bought. I forget who it was right now. Remind me of his name. I forget who it was. Okay, and he okay, actually pulled okay. a million dollars out of the deal by doing a commercial deal. He has never claimed with all his $2 billion worth of residential real estate that he's made to do that. So I think the point <laughs> is kind of made. All right, valuations on these two types of real estate are gonna look different. For example, on residential, valuation is determined by comparable homes that recently sold in the area. So for example, if I wanted to buy a $350,000-ish home that is for sale in a neighborhood, and a lot of the other homes recent, you know, recently in the last six months nearby were selling in that 340, 350, 360,000, and then similar square footage and similar bedrooms and bathrooms, I'd be like, oh, this home is probably worth 350-ish thousand dollars because that's what the other very similar homes have sold for. That's how they usually decide the value right. of something in residential. It's what other people have been willing to pay for similar real estate. I fully agree. And that's where it contrasts from commercial real estate because commercial, they don't rely on comps. A commercial property is valued on the basis of a multiple of its rental income. 
So if a property is generating 100,000 in rental income, and let's say cap rates are 10%, that means that building is valued at a million dollars. But if you and I can figure out a way of doubling that rental income from 100,000 to 200,000 by changing the tenant, for instance, from a thrift store to a coffee shop or anything like that, if the rental goes to 200,000, the value of the building goes to 2 million. The value of a commercial building is a multiple of its rental income. That gives us the chance to use a lot of creativity to increase the value of the rental and therefore the value of the building. Which is kind of interesting because creativity over here on this side actually enables you to increase the value of something and you're only limited by your own creativity. On this side, there's not that much creativity. There's a right. little here, there's a little there, but there's also a strength in that lack of creativity because it becomes a little bit more of a static known. It's like if I bought this thing 30% below market, I know it because there's no creativity in really determining what comps are. For the most part, it's kind of set in stone. So they're totally different games from each other, but they both have a way of increasing value. No doubt on this side of the fence, if you get creative, you can get rewarded in really big ways. Residential versus commercial. Now what we're going to do is we're going to evaluate cash flow. This comes from leverage.com. And um, what they're going to do is they're going to help us understand the difference between commercial and residential in terms of lease, risk, and tenants. I think this will kind of like broaden out and give us a bigger understanding of what is this container in comparing these two. Dolph, here on the lease, they're saying that commercial leases are usually five to 15 years and that residential leases are usually one year, maybe a little higher, and there's gonna be higher tenant turnover. That is not inaccurate, and I would say I agree with them on that point. However, that's not the full story. There are so many things we could discuss about the leases on commercial buildings and how they differ from the leases on residential buildings that, again, make commercial such an attractive proposition. Yes, it's true that they tend to be longer in duration, but when you have a rent review, the rent on commercial properties, it's in most commercial lease contracts standard around the world, that the rent can stay the same or it can go up, but it cannot go down. It's called a ratchet clause, and I want to be really specific here. Ratchet is one word, not two words. I know some tenants probably think it's two words, but it means that it goes up but not down. That is great. You don't have that with residential, and you might say, well, that's that's totally unfair. But having a ratchet clause in commercial leases enables landlords to offer lower base rents than they otherwise would. So it benefits everyone. Secondly, if ever someone wants to sell a business, they can sell the business to a new tenant, but the deal has to be approved by the landlord. It's called an assignment of lease document. And it stipulates that should the new incoming business owner fail to pay the rent, the old business owner will continue to pay it. I've never had that on a residential property or an outgoing tenant guarantees the rent for me for the new incoming tenant. Not gonna lie, I think that's all pretty cool. It's like, I get a tenant and let's say they sign, I've seen Amazon sign 30 year deals. Yes. And it's like, wow, I don't have to find a new tenant and every year it ratchets up, however, when you own commercial, depending on the size of it, you've bitten off a big obligation. And so if you go an extended period of time without a tenant, what that does is that can create some risk. You see, it's typically easier to find residential tenants in the real estate game on residential. However, you don't have that really so much on the commercial side. On the commercial side, you better have lined someone up or, I mean, what's the longest you've ever seen a building go vacant where you've had to actually cover that expense until you actually had someone in there? Oh, I thought you were going to ask me what's the longest I've ever seen a commercial building go vacant. And yes, I fully admit I've seen them vacant for years, but not ones that I've owned. Because it's true that with residential, if you are not getting a tenant, there's only one problem, guys. It's not that the color of the carpet in the spare bedroom is wrong or the aspect of the window in the kitchen when the sun rises in the morning and the wintertime relative to whatever. No, it's just that the rent's too high. Drop it by 100 a month and you will get a tenant. Whereas with commercial, you might have dropped it by 50% and it's still vacant, but you've got to figure out ways of targeting commercial tenants. And we have an 18 step plan for getting a tenant. That's why I never fear if you and I owned a vacant, ugly warehouse in a sea of similarly vacant and ugly warehouses, I would not fret because I'd know within a month we'd have a tenant for our warehouse. And there's a specific formula as to how we can do that. And a willing tenant, by the way. It's again what you said before, you can use your creativity to come up with ideas that the other commercial landlords don't just come up with. They just say, oh, I'm not managing to get a tenant, but they're not doing anything about it. So I think this one is debatable. Yeah. And evidence can show that you and I would find a tenant for a vacant commercial space. Perfect. Yeah. The third one here, tenants. Commercial properties have higher value tenants. They basically put everything on the line. And by the way, they typically want to do improvements on the property and they're willing to actually 
pay more on an increased basis over time to have basically have those tenant improvements. Um, meanwhile, in the game of real estate, it's different, right? I mean, this person is going to live there for one, two, or three years, right. and they're going to move on, and it's just a bit of a different game. It is a different game because most residential tenants aspire to one day own their own home. So in that basis, you'll never get a tenant forever. Whereas with commercial, it's very common that they want to lease their properties. They want their capital deployed in their business, not on their premises. In fact, I've often bought a building from a company that owns the building and the business, and they, want, they want to divest themselves of the building to put the surplus cash flow into their business. So yes, you can get them for a long time. And I agree, and I'm happy to report to everyone that you just used number three as an advantage of commercial. Thank you. You're very, very welcome. Mm. I can be fair. <laughs> Dolph, you make some really fine arguments, but we've got to also talk about the reality of this. Financing, is it easier to get financing on residential or commercial? In general, for beginners, it's much easier to get financing on residential properties. That's been my personal experience. Every time I go and buy Mind something you. commercial, it's if SBA is involved, they want to do all this. It sometimes is a multi-month process to go through. Correct. Um, but in the game of real estate, this is what banks do on a pretty regular basis, and they're used to it. Neither you will or you won't qualify. You're going to find out pretty quickly. And reality is, if you have good credit, and if you have good job history, and if you have the down payment, you're probably going to get a loan. And so it's a little bit of a different game there, I think, on the real estate side, just being more accessible for residential because it's just something that more people can easily do. Whereas commercial, well, you said it. It's really a creative game and there's opportunities for a lot more commonplace creativity, even from a bank. Even when I did my last loan, I was surprised at like how they underwrote my situation. Like, well, we could do this. We could bridge loan that. We could make this happen. I'm like, Wow, I would never see anything at all like that for a residential loan. So almost two different worlds. It is two different worlds. I fully agree. When you're starting out, it is easier to get a loan on a residential property than on a commercial property. Having said that, once you have enough commercial properties under the belt, banks will vie with each other to offer you the money. Once they see that you can perform and that you actually pay the mortgage payment every month, they want your business. So Dolph, in all fairness, which is it? Is it commercial? Is it residential? Which one's better? You know, it depends on the deal. Rather than say residential is always better or commercial is always better, I look at both. Full disclosure, I've bought four houses this year and I've turned them into VRBOs. That's doing very well. We're getting, you know, a good return on those. Um, but I look at both residential and commercial and whatever comes up that offers me a spectacular deal, especially if I don't need to put any cash into it, even more so if I can pull cash out of it, even more so if I've got three or four banks vying with each other, they will lend you the money. No, we'll lend you the money. If we give you a commitment to give you the money now, will you give us a commitment to take our money? That's the sort of situation you want. I don't really care whether it's commercial, industrial, hospitality, you name it, as long as it's real estate. You know, I think one of the debates that's really popular out there is this idea that you start in residential and then you graduate to commercial. And I think from what I've learned from you and just my own personal experience is, I don't think it's a chronology of graduation. I think it is really more about, first of all, what is your own temperament like? What do you personally enjoy? I feel like often the success of an investor is not the strategy or technique, but how they feel about it. You know, if you've ever gone into any type of financial game with a low degree of confidence or with worry or with fear, you're probably gonna eventually give up on that because you're not gonna have the motivation that you need. Similarly, if you find the right strategy that, that excites you, and you can see Dolph has a, an incredible amount of passion for commercial. I've got an incredible amount of passion for residential. And the reality is we cross pollinate. We do some and a lot of both. I think it really is about different strokes for different people. You gotta be honest with yourself and what you really want. And I think you should be aware. There's major winning in both games. And part of that is your definition of what winning is. When I was young and 21, buying 25 single family homes, paying me 12 grand a month was winning because it got me out of my job and that worked. I don't know if had I not had a mentor like you, if I would have actually been able to achieve that in commercial. Today, obviously, I know that I could have, but that's really all I had access to at that time. So I'm very, very grateful for that experience thousands and thousands of homes ago. And yet I'm loving the game of commercial right today more than ever before. It's a fun game. It's an exciting game because that creativity can yield really high ROIs. 
I fully agree. And if you like this creative process, which you obviously do, and you're great at it, I think it's a great outlet. I had a, a premise that was vacant, and I always thought it would make a great coffee shop. And who would have thought that coffee shops would take off in America 40 years ago, or whatever it was, when Starbucks first came around? If you said, let's invest in a company that will have coffee stores on every corner, I would have said, no, there's not enough demand. But anyway, I thought this premise would be great as a coffee shop. I advertised it to find a tenant, and I couldn't get one. And after three months, I thought, well, either I'm wrong, it's not a good location for a coffee shop, or people don't have foresight. So what I decided to do is to create the coffee shop. I bought the furniture, the crockery, the cutlery, the barista machine, and got the staff in and trained them up. And I was the chief um, quality control officer, if you like. And then after three months, I had a really good functioning coffee shop, which I sold. And I made a profit on the sale, about $10,000 relative to what I'd spent. But it wasn't about making that profit. I created a lease, a five-year lease, with two rights of renewal for five-year lease. And that is what generated my revenue. That's where my value came from. But I had fun in the process. If something like that is fun for you, you'll be great at commercial real estate. If on the other hand, it's a burden and you'd rather invest in residential or do any other kind of investment activity, then do what fires you up. You want something that when you wake up in the morning, you say, yeah, I can't wait to get out of bed because I want to finish this coffee shop or I want to create that or do this. That's what keeps us going. Dolph, you make so many amazing good points. And I want to tell you all something right now. I love this man. He is my original real estate mentor. And I'm inviting you in the link below to access his social media and start following him and learning from him because it continues to be a benefit to me. Additionally, if you want to learn how to get in the game of residential real estate, if you're like, after watching this video, Chris, I love that you can consistently produce, let's call it a 34% ROI, compound that on a regular basis, and over time, take a little bit amount of money and turn it into a lot of money and have it be completely passive, then this might be something for you to look into Partnering with me is usually where someone has some money sitting in a 401k, an IRA, they wanna be passive, they see my track record on my last $2 billion of real estate holdings, and they say, I want those ROIs. And if you wanna access them, click the link below, fill out the information, go through a qualification process. Not everyone's a good fit to partner with me because if we do this and if we're long-term partners, I'm here to do my part to help you become a mega multimillionaire in the game that compounds and creates a legacy for future generations. And um, so click that link and let's connect. So Dolph, is it commercial or is it residential? It's both. Okay, that's the honest answer, right? <laughs> yes. And it depends on you and your temperament. And most people, if I had to look at their financial situation and say, where are they financially sitting? It's that they don't have the diversification that they really need. So we're gonna talk a little bit about diversification in this next video, not just residential, not just commercial, but all the other things that you really should be considering with your hard earned money.